Um, so first, it's an honor to be here. Um, I hope uh, if I can make this as practical as possible for all of you. Um, so as I put in the notes in earlier, uh, if you have anything specific you want me to discuss or any specific takeaways you'd like to have, uh, please let me know. Uh, just put that in the chat box. I'll be watching that on a regular basis to uh, keep track of all that stuff. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome. Um, so as I said, uh, one thing I like always like to do whenever I start any kind of educational session is to get a good understanding of who you are and who's available. It looks like we have 38 people or 39 people now that's uh, in the room. So if you can uh, just jot down in the chat box what you teach and anything specific you'd like to get out of it, um, I can make sure I can uh, cover those, some of those areas for you. Okay? So uh, a quick bit about me. Um, I have a, a mechanical engineer undergraduate and then an MBA from OSU and then two doctorates. First one's is in business and second one's in uh, psychology. Um, so which brings a pretty interesting way of looking at education from a psychological perspective. Um, something I'll always like to add is to explore the, edu the educational psychology part and how we teach. So regardless of what we teach, the educational psychology part gets to be integrated in understanding how the human brain learns. So we're going to talk a little bit about that um, in this session as part of the uh, foundations. So, um, and feel free to let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow and ask any questions. I'm kind of watching the, all the great comments here already on what courses you guys teach uh, and we'd like to get out of this session. So in this uh, quick 30 minutes, um, I've kind of designed this in three specific sections. The first section will give you some content. As academics, everybody loves theories and want to understand the how or why we do what we do. So we're going to discuss a little bit about the content, about the brain and how we learn and how we remember what we learn and what, what is knowledge. And then we're going to discuss a little bit about the skill side of it, which is the context. Um, so what specific skills do you have or what we can use to develop and what ideas and practices you can get into. And then the third part is going to be the process side. The process side is what I've kind of developed over the many years to engage not just the online classroom, but the regular physical classrooms as well to make learning fun and interesting uh, and, and have everybody learn something that's completely going to be very meaningful. The process side is something that you can do on your own without you know, needing any specific technologies or anything, but it's just a step-by-step -step process to uh, help you make the classroom more fun and make your uh, job a lot more fun. So, and that's also something that, you know, I'm always kind of watch tracking myself as far as efficiency is concerned. You know, being a mechanical engineer, I always have that efficiency in the back of my mind as I'm teaching class. You know, I don't know how many of you actually calculated uh, how many hours do you work for a class and how much do you get paid uh, on each one of those hours. If you're not efficient, you end up making, you know, $10, $20 an hour from what you get paid to teach a class as opposed to if you learn to get more efficient, you can easily make $50 to $100 per hour um, if you're managing your processes. So we'll talk a little bit about that if we have more time to go. Okay, so let's start with exploring the box of education. So whenever, you know, when you think of a box, everybody talks about how think outside the box. The challenge is the minute you believe there's a box, you never get out of one. You're always in one. So even if you get out of one box, you're in a bigger box. And the box of education tends to put people into an environment where they come to listen to the professors and the teachers, and everybody just sits there and listens. And that is a very old uh, idea. But you know, it's interesting when I look at the, the various universities that I've worked with all across the world, most people, most universities don't give people the training to get out of that box. So all they do is lecture. Uh, on a regular basis and everybody sits and listens and when no matter how good the lecture is people will forget what they learn so we want to get out of that whole box of education All right. so uh, let's start with uh, thinking about what is learning you know, so when you think about learning what does that mean to you how do you specifically learn so there's a couple of quotes here I've put on here um, when it comes to learning you know the first one in the red here is to standing on the edge of a cliff, right? So if you think about when you stand on the edge of a cliff, what exactly are you feeling at that point when you stand on the edge of a cliff? What is that emotion, right? When I'm doing this in class, a lot of times people are saying, well, it's scare, it's fear, and then I challenge them. Why not a positive emotion, right? Another one here is the learning is a state of confusion. The more you confuse the students, sometimes the more they're going to be curious and open to learning. 
Now, the one in the blue here is the major one that I'm going to kind of discuss on how people are learning. It's the relative permanent change, right? Change requires some type of specific change, not just in the mental state, but also in the behavior side, as well as, you know, everything, decisions they make and how they engage with everybody else. So keeping in mind that in order for people to learn, the emotional aspects, whether you're on the edge of a cliff, whether you're confused, those are the key pieces that makes information people gain into knowledge. Now, um, let's talk about the right and the left brain. Um, when you think about the right and left brain, these are not necessarily completely separate compartments, but there are specific functions that are more left brain dominant versus the right brain dominant. Okay? So the right brain is typically for the emotional side, for the imagination, but it's also where the emotions are kept. This is how we really can engage the students so they remember what they learn from us. Typically, most of education is done on the left-hand side, which is all, a lot of analytical stuff. So we do analysis, we read papers, we write papers and so forth, but that is also short memory. People will remember very little of whatever they learn in the left brain side if we just give them a test and they move on with their lives. You know, so it's always a fun joke sometimes whenever I go into different educational environments and ask people, what did you learn in your last class? Uh, or what did you learn in the last two classes? And most people come up with, well, uh, we don't really remember, or you know, they may say one or two things after spending many, many hours in class. So the key is to how do we get everybody to get engaged with the right brain side of the learning curve so that they can actually remember everything. So if we were in person, um, we, would, we would do a clutch hands exercise to kind of play around with that a little bit. But to move things to the right side of the brain for long-term memory, it's going to be a lot of confusion, you know, adding a lot of emotional pieces so that emotions are engaged. So confusion is a common one, but we can get them excited, we can get them angry, we can play around with different emotions. Okay. Uh, colors are always a good thing. Um, so the right brain is very much on the visual side, so when you use different colors, and you can use colors in the classroom, as, on the online classroom as well. When you type things out, you can make different colors to make it more fun and interesting, or even add a visual on there. Right. And uh, the calling out, raising your hand piece, those are for the physical classes. So a lot of that engages the right and the left brain from a learning perspective. Okay. Now, here's a fun little equation for you. Uh, when you look at information, everything we do from a textbook, from the online learning classroom, from Blackboard, all the materials we give to our students, that is only information. That is not yet knowledge. When we look at actual what becomes knowledge, what do you think goes into the... Uh, the yeah, blank there. Anybody have any ideas? Feel free to type that out. I will give you a hint. Experience is a good one, Cindy. Typing with a little mouse isn't as easy as it looks. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, emotion, exactly, good. So emotion is what gives you the experience, is what enables people to have fun whatever they're learning. And that emotion will help people memorize or remember what they've learned so that whatever you work with them, they will remember you. Yeah. So all that has to be incorporated into that online classroom because most people are simply typing uh, responses in an online classroom and they're not necessarily emotionally engaged as much as we like to. And the key word here, I want to make sure that, you know, well, what we want to do is get away from the what I call forgettable education. Okay. There's a lot of people, you know, if you ask your students, what did you learn in the last few classes, see what kind of responses they get. It's, it's a pretty interesting uh, what the students tell us when we ask those kind of questions. So when we look at those type of emotions, the emotional intelligence is obviously the, the key foundation here from a learning perspective. But creating the emotional attachments to whatever you're teaching them uh, is going to be the key. So awareness of the individual students, so understanding the individual students, right? And this is something that I do, uh, just kind of naturally do for a long time now. But, you know, as I asked you about your courses and what you're kind of interested in learning in this particular workshop, this gets me to understand where you're coming from. You know, if you're teaching, let's see, operations management or, you know, international business and, and other courses, I can see what courses you're teaching and then I can have some awareness of where your interests are and your expertise, and then wrap whatever I'm going to teach 
around your interests. Right. So, um, so that's the kind of step one. Identify the desired emotion. Um, in that particular step, then we kind of look at what is the emotion I want to create in the classroom. So, with regards to whatever topic you're teaching, consider the emotional environment that you're going to create in the class. From my perspective, I always tend to use uh, emotions like curiosity. I tend to challenge students quite a bit on finding the courage to do something differently and always empowering them to go take action. So, and then creating the activity that en enables that specific emotion. So when we look at the classroom discussion, we'll do an example of that at the, towards the end. The specific activity you create in the classroom has to be uh, in connected with the individual's awareness of whatever they want to learn and also their desired emotion. So th this activity is a combination of these two elements back here. Okay. So, um, and then capturing that emotion and then the measurements. Now the measurements are going to be the key. Typically in education, most of the measurements are the papers that we have or the tests and you know, the assignments we throw at the students. But in the world of emotional intelligence and getting them to remember what they're going to learn, the key measurement has to be about how they apply something they've learned from you and the outcomes of that application. Getting the students to go above and beyond thinking the classroom is an isolated environment where if I go to class, it's just a blackboard assignment, it's just a computer and I just typing papers and then, you know, submitting paper. Those are the measurements for learning. But in reality, the measurements can be much more integrated from the student's perspective and their, the rest of their lives, right? So their measurements could be coming from their bosses or their peers, whatever you get them to apply. So the key is to get them to apply, and that's where learning can become a much more powerful tool. All right, so next I'm going to talk about a three different specific aspects of educational psychology a little bit. Uh, part of the foundations of engaging the students in an online environment, right? So educational psychology, it's always a fascinating study. I hope uh, if you have time, you know, just go kind of explore exactly all the different rich research that's out there. Uh, there's all different ways to engage people, engage students in different ways. Um, it is a, a fun study of looking at how the human brain learns and the, the learning specific functions that happen within the classroom or any specific environment and making that emotional content is always going to be the primary key to making learning happen. And when I say learn, it's not about regurgitating a test or regurgitating a concept, but being able to know it, be able to recall it on a regular basis, and more importantly, apply it to their regular lives. And this is where we can make CityU a very powerful engine of innovation and application, and we can get a lot more students if we get our students to go apply on a regular basis. So all aspects of life can be integrated into learning as part of the process. Now, one of the main theories in educational psychology was called constructivism. Here, basically, the theory states that in order for adults to learn, they're going to build from what they already know. So you know, it's an integration between the new knowledge that you bring in their classroom with their knowledge and what they understand and then putting all that together. That is the key part where knowledge becomes a function of a collaboration process. Right? So if you don't know your student's work environment, if you don't know, you know your student's personal interest, it becomes really hard for you to take all of that knowledge and experience you have and then just kind of put it on top without being able to integrate it. So in every single classroom, I always tend to challenge people to get a good understanding of the students at an individual level using the process we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we can kind of, kind of build that knowledge one piece at a time using their knowledge as well as your expertise, putting that together to make something that's going to be sustainable within their own minds. And then finally, this is what I call the knowledge creation spiral. So this is a process where we look at learning in a very different way, right? So we always start here at the tacit knowledge piece. Tacit knowledge is what you know internally in your own brain and how you come to know something, right? So this could be your favorite color. Uh, this could be your favorite foods. This could be your, your worst teacher, your most loved teacher, or your favorite topic. All that is part of the tacit knowledge. This is the information that's inside the student's head that is a starting point of constructivism, okay? So if you don't know that the tacit knowledge inside the students, I challenge you to go kind of explore that and figure out how to obtain that tacit knowledge. Okay. 
Now, the explicit knowledge is the easy part. This is the contents that's already inside Blackbook or Blackboard, all the textbooks, all the articles, all that information, that's already pre-built for every single class. Right? And then within the learning process, this is now the students start to reading the materials, doing the assignments. Right? Once you have this starting point of obtaining new information, that's all that is so far, obtaining that information from everything that's in the explicit knowledge world. The key here has to be application. If they do not apply it, they're not going to remember it. So this is where we come in as, as faculty members to create personal meaning so that the learning has a personal emotional attachment. And this is where we're going to talk a little bit later about Socratic methods and how to use Socratic methods in the classroom so that the students learn the most from every engagement they have with you and makes your classroom much more interesting as well as minimizing the amount of time you spend typing out uh, different things in the classroom too. So uh, once you're able to ask them the right questions to get them to apply, and then the connotation and personal attachment happens, and then that information can become knowledge, which can be sustained within the student's mind, as well as makes your learning a lot more interesting. Okay. So this entire process is what's called the knowledge creation spiral. All right, now we get to a little bit of the fun side where we kind of start playing around with the various ideas for application and some of the skills that you can particularly develop. So now what I'm going to look at is how do we create an accountability structure for learning? Now in the typical traditional education environment, the accountability structure is this paper is due on Sunday, your posting are due on Thursday, and then you know there's a very rigid pace for accountability for assignments. And those are just analytical processes uh, built within the Blackboard. In the online classroom, you can even make it more fun by creating accountability structures to challenge students to go apply whatever they're going to learn. So not, I'm sure not all your classes have are built in with action plans. I tend to use this uh, in a lot of my classes where I challenge students to go, OK, you've learned this. Now, what are you going to do with it? Go apply it. Create an action plan to go do it. Within the action plan, there's always time to go make an action, take an action, and then measure the outcomes, and then come back and discuss it. That makes the discussion chats much more interesting rather than the constant regurgitation. And I'm sure most of you have been teaching the classes much more frequently already, so you don't want to be reading the same exact responses about you know, whatever theories on um, you know, management or whatever theories on operations. Those kind of get really boring for you to read. But if you get students to apply it, that reading becomes much more interesting. It also becomes much more relevant for the students, and you can learn something about their environment too. Okay, So this accountability structure um, happens in the online environment where you can engage every single student and challenge them to take action. Okay, So think about what, you know, if we would take this workshop and say, let's say this is a, the actual class, right? I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do differently? and you in your class. I'm going to ask you when you're going to do it, and what are the measurements you're going to use to assess how successful you are with that specific action. And now the final part is who is going to hold you accountable. Right? Without somebody holding you accountable, human beings are very, very good at making excuses. You know, sometimes we, we let ourselves go all the time. You know, I'm too tired, and I, I don't have time to eat, or whatever the excuses are, or my computer crashed, and I need to get a computer. Um, whatever the excuses are, if you have someone holding you accountable to taking action, that would, that's going to be the key to making a major difference. Okay. You're going to go through this entire two days of this faculty development, and I hope that from every single class, somebody will ask you, what are you going to do with that based on what you learn? Okay. So feel free to share with me uh, any thoughts and ideas based on what we've covered today so far. So far. Um, what are you going to do differently? Have you seen anything that's going to be very different from what you normally do and how you're going to improve that. So I see a few people typing, so feel free to kind of enter a few thoughts in here. A few of you are typing, I'm going to kind of continue forward since we don't have too much time here. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, one comment says, like the idea of making an action plan, have to figure out how that will work, especially since I'm not 
teaching, or, or they not been, they have not been teaching. I teach future teachers. Great. So the fun part is about teaching future teachers that you can set a great example to make that happen, right? So getting them to uh, really reflect on how they can apply something. Take the idea that the educational system is not just a an isolated system. When they learn, they have to go apply. So make learning in, as integrated as uh, possible. Okay. Um, so. Socratic methods, I'm sure you've all heard of the term, is the art of asking questions, right? So when you ask questions, it really goes in line with constructivism, and it's also one of the key aspects for transformational leadership for intellectual stimulation aspect. So I've kind of jotted down a few keys to using Socratic methods. Uh, the key here, one of the key here is always use open-ended questions. Open-ended questions will get people to think and make them be more curious. Another key part, especially in the online environment, make sure that you don't make any judgments. There's no right or wrong answers, right? If the student really goes off in the far direction in a, in a direction that is completely wrong, um, you simply ask them questions to guide them back and ask them how that may be looked at a different perspective. Okay. Now, with the action plan idea, the action orientation and the time bound is the two keys that you can really make learning more fun and interesting. If you ask them to take action on any, any topic, uh, you know, I, I find students tend to speak at a very theoretical level, like, you know, you read in the book, you know, leaders have to communicate often. Okay, great. How are they going to communicate? What is the frequency of that communication, right? Um, so I start challenging them on practical actions. If there's no practical action in the discussion, then the discussion gets really boring and I get bored. I don't really want to get online to look at it. But if I get them to tell me something really, really practical, it becomes much more interesting to, and play around with it. Okay. And of course, you should always have an emotional target. You know, as one of the key aspects of the emotional intelligence piece, emotional alchemy is the concept behind this, but basically being able to create the desired emotional state within a group. In the inline environment, you can easily create curiosity, empowerment. Sometimes you can play around with anger a little bit, but that's a little bit more dangerous of a topic to uh, emotion to kind of play with. But using Socratic methods, you can use all these different tools to get people to take action. Okay. All right. Don't have too much time on this. Let me figure out, let me just kind of go through the process here so that I give you something that's very practical uh, for you to use in your classroom. So whenever I start a class, the first thing I always do is to have it, you know, revise the welcome, you know, generic thing, say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm from this, I don't really care. It doesn't really matter where you're from. Tell me exactly what your core values are, what your passions are, what your goals and challenges are, and get them to share something that is personally relevant to them. Right? And then I go create an inventory of student data. This inventory of student data, this is not the data that you know the university may have about the addresses and emails and stuff, but this data is personal data about their core values, their passions and goals. That allows me to engage them at a very different level than it does the typical information, which we don't really get too much information about students other than their names, right? So getting that part is the building part of the educational process. And then once we get into reading the post and looking at the weekly discussions, asking open-ended question, creating accountability structure for action, and then challenge their thinking. There's no post on there that I don't have a question for. I'm always asking them questions on every little part, okay? And then of course, Seek the impact, measure it, that's it. No. Okay, looks like I'm out of time. Uh, feel free to click on the link for the evaluation. If you have any questions, feel free to type it in here. I can type the question back so I'm not running over into somebody else's time slot. All right, thank you very much for attending.